Can I ask you a weird question to start with? Oh, go on then. What, why, why have I heard of you? Oh, I don't know. Usually people have heard of me because I said something mean about David Cameron once on the internet. Right. Or I sued Katie Hopkins. I know that bit, but let's the, go back before I was before the poor that. kid that made meals out of tins and got a cookbook deal. That, that. They're generally, I fall into one of three categories. Everyone people. said rude things about <laughs> David Cameron on, on the internet. Yes, but um, any one of them gets it thrown back in their face on a near daily basis. Hopkins is, is, is hopefully yesterday's news, but we'll certainly... Talk about your role in. Been in, hoping that for quite some years, yes, actually, we'll, but she's just not going away. Talk about your role in that. <laughs> Let's begin then with the with the because lots of people from working class backgrounds struggling to hold it together um, exist. Yes, you elected to tell your story when blogging was still a relatively novel concept, mm -hmm. and well, you tell me. Well, I mean, I was a single mum on the dole. Uh, unemployed, struggling with benefits that were being delayed and suspended and just outright withdrawn. Um, and I started to take an interest in local politics because my son's children's centre was being closed down um, at a time where I was looking for employment. So, Which I obviously makes finding employment considerably harder than it yeah, would have been. Yeah, absolutely, because, yes. uh, for, I mean, for a start as a single parent, you're stuck in, I can find a job that starts at half past eight in the morning and finishes at 5.30 yes. if I'm willing to pay for the eight till six childcare. Everywhere then was starting to cotton on to zero-hour contracts and flexible working. You must be flexible within the, the, all seven days of the week, which is impossible when you're a single parent to commit to. And then my nearest childcare facility was shut down. So I was like, right, I'm going to start going to local council meetings things and seeing who these people are that make these decisions what, was, that negatively what year was this where are we now when, Ooh, 2011 okay. 2011 2012 yeah it's hard to believe i'm still going really but i'm I, I'm, I'm here yes. um, yeah you are definitely as I started here, off sort of yelling <laughs> through the letters page of the local newspaper so you where just I got started. engaged i just in i just woke up there was, sense a, of all. there was a um front page of a newspaper my local newspaper the south end echo and it was a local councillor who said, druggies, drunks and single mums are ruining our high street. I was outraged. Now, people are now familiar with my levels of outrage. When I get going, I get going. I wrote a letter to the South End Echo that was so long and so furious, I had to print it in three parts <laughs> across three <laughs> consecutive days. And um, one of my friends who works there uh, said, well, if you thought of writing a blog, a blog, a what? What's a blog? I thought it sounded like, you know, I thought it, it sounded... Uh, yeah, trivial and silly yeah. so it's like a diary online and I was like as someone who kept teenage diaries as you know as a teenager I was like this is this seems therapeutic seems like a good way to get things out so I started going to council meetings because I wanted to see who these people were that were shutting our libraries shutting our children's centres how they came to the decisions that negatively impacted mine and other people's lives so I was doing local politics basically yes. from the public gallery the only person there nine times out of ten apart from the local press journalist mm and um, started writing about it. And that evolved into um, getting pieces in the paper. Sometimes they wouldn't have a political journalist to send because um, we all know local news is under an awful lot of pressure now um, financially. Um, so they would just give me a ring and say, do you mind covering it? And so then that led to I was writing recipes online at the same time uh, um, under the same banner under the same banner it was, a, it okay, was, so it was my a, website it was a blog of your life, as it were. and it started off as here's the local council meeting and then here's the local council meeting and a soup I made so it's a little bit it's a little bit of a hybrid I remember being quite annoyed actually um, I get annoyed all the time but it's always very minor it's always over very quickly um, I can't decide if that's my Irish temperament or my Greek temperament or some <laughs> awful tornado in the middle of the two. Um, but but I'm quite annoyed because I'm sitting there writing these long pieces about yes. like local councillors and like doing real electoral analysis and spreadsheets, love a spreadsheet, and you know voter predictions and stuff. Yes. You know, really getting into it. And then I put a recipe up for carrot soup, and it got about ten times the views of uh, anything I'd ever written about South End politics. And yes. I was like, well, that's rude. Yes. And then I was like, oh, hang on, it seems that there's a, an appetite for this, a market for this. So I started to write more about what I was cooking. And it, none of it was contrived. It was literally, this is the change I found on the back of the couch. This is what I made with it. I look back, my photos from the time were atrocious. They were taken on a like rubbish little phone camera in but a touched, poorly knit flat. It cut uh, through, something yeah, happened. Yeah. When did you realise something was happening? I wrote a blog post in July 2012 called Hunger Hurts. Yes. And it was just the end of my tether. I was suicidal. I was absolutely, completely depressed. Not a word I use lightly. Um, I was trying to cobble together meals to feed a very young child that would 
give him just enough nutrition to get through the day without attracting the attention of social services or any other any other caregivers because I my parents were foster carers so I grew up with a household of a revolving door of children who had been taken away from their parents so I always had this fear from right when I was pregnant if I don't do right by this child he's going to get taken away and an irrational fear but I grew up with nearly a hundred children with various backgrounds and some of the reasons they'd been taken into care seems to me as just a child myself at yeah. the time spurious you okay. know because we obviously weren't told too much sure so, so you, you process get, it in, in oh in, this in... this child's with you because his mum only fed him pot noodles and that hey. sticks and you're like of course well no i can't but There'll as an adult now you know that, there's a that, lot more yes. to it than that but for so me i had a very unreasonable fear of yes. if i tell anyone how bad it is he'll get taken away okay. so my blog was pretty much anonymous. None of my friends read it. None of my family read it. My readers were scattered up and down the country. There were people who didn't know me. And then I woke up one morning and a couple of days after I'd written Hunger Hurts and it had gone absolutely viral. And I was terrified because I suddenly started getting all these questions and all this attention and all this negative attention, as well as people going, oh, God, what can I do to help? What do we mean by viral, Jack? I mean, how, how, how are you gauging it? I think it? two million people read it. Shut up. From 17 readers. Seriously? Yeah, so, so people just started boom. spreading it around and it yeah. touched so many nerves. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's now studied at GCSE. It's in a mock exam at GCSE. It's as, me on one what? page and Sylvia Plath on the other. Is it really? I don't know how not to write your English exam. No, it's clearly, that was silly, but it <laughs> um, is it's the power. Power of, of first person narrative. Probably. Oh, I look back now. Or despair. And I look at it now and I think, I look at it and it's so poorly written. And I'm like, oh God, I wish they'd given me a chance to edit it before they stuck it in the AQA mock examination <laughs> paper. But, but that perhaps was part of the reason why, why, why yeah, it affected it was people because there was no contrivance. Yeah, it's about storytelling and about communication and about. Um, you know about it was about basically about that. Um, right, let's go back before that. So now I know where the where the sort of Jack Munro public figure. Yes, that's how it was boomed into life, really. But, but before that, it was, the blog was called "A Girl Called Jack." Yes, I, I am of a generation that I'm of an outlook that is open to learning new things mm -hmm. and changing. But I'm of an age that means trans growing up was, mm -hmm. not, was not anything that we even addressed. Also, probably going to an all-boys school run by Benedictine monks meant it was even less likely <laughs> <laughs> to pop up on our radar. So I, I know that you refer to yourself as they rather than he or she. Yeah, I'm OK with the she. Um, but if we're talking about gender issues, I prefer to use the pronoun they because I think a lot of people are gender neutral, gender queer, non-binary, like myself. Um, and I think as somebody with a public platform, I've got a bit of a duty to sort of get yes. the they out there, if okay. that makes sense. Yes. Um, so I, I, don't lose not... my, you know, I don't lose my shit if somebody she's me, you know, because I'm, I'm, I look and at myself And when did you make this decision? About two years ago, October so, 2015. So when you started doing the blog, you thought of yourself as a girl yeah, called Jack. Yeah, it was a girl called Jack. I just didn't... But for me, there was always that play on words. It's like of a boy course. named Sue, isn't it? Yeah, it's yes. a girl called Jack. It yes. was like a girl with didn't a boy's that, you know, name. Cash. Someone else wrote it, and he found out last week. I always thought Johnny Cash wrote that himself. Oh, no. Yeah, don't sorry, tell I've ruined me that. it for you. Oh, no. I, 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 I may have got that wrong. You'll be but telling me next that David Attenborough was not a very nice man. Well, well, don't, <laughs> don't, be, don't be ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. So do you understand why... I mean, look, people in, in the right-wing media are always looking for targets and always looking for... Mm. for so that, that's a slightly different question to decent people who struggle to understand what you've just said so casually. People who aren't looking for um, hooks upon which to hang their bigotries or to indulge mm. in otherness. They just grew up in a world where everyone was either a boy or a girl. They yeah. thought... And now they're being told that their world was never like that. No, I think there's a, a lot greater understanding now of um, of gender and sex being two separate things. So sex is broadly it's your biology, it's your chromosomes, it's your you've got XX chromosomes, XY chromosomes. Not point something like not point seven percent of people have got chromosomal differences mm. so they don't fit exactly on the xxxy spectrum but that's what we understand to be female yes. xx chromosomes male xy chromosomes a little bit of variance deviation in there gender however is a social construct it's a series of behaviors that is um put upon us from a very young age you know from man up or girls don't sit like that mm. 
from a very young age, girls wear frilly, pretty things. My Little Pony, pinks and sparkles. Boys play with action men. And, and so it's a very set series of behaviours ascribed to individual sexes. But that behaviour is what we would call gendered behaviour. So your sex can be fixed. My sex isn't going to change. Sure. I can't. I can't just get in there and fidget about with my chromosomes and you know poke them into a Y shape. Sound and nor like would Russell I want Brandon to. You, you know, <laughs> get in there fidget. It has, with the comparison has previously been drawn. Has we have been seen in a room together. We've both got the same editor. That would be a scoop. Oh, we've, we, honestly, it? we've got the same editor at um, Bluebird Carol. She's really lovely. But the pair of us in a room together both suddenly just went full Essex. And Fantastic. we're like, yeah, 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 how you doing? I'm Russell all day. It was so funny. He was but, the first, um, first guest on Unfiltered, actually. He's so actually, symmetry. he's brilliant. I absolutely him. love him. So this is nature um, nurture, simply put. Yeah, basically, nature language. versus nurture. Yeah. And so non-binary, so gender as a binary, if we, if we throw sex out of it for a minute... <laughs> little flappy hands. Yeah. Gender as a binary, you'd have very female gendered behaviour and very male gendered behaviour. And female female behaviour is typically seen to be nurturing and caring and, and you know, caring professions and mm. a very, like, gentle, very sort of a very specific way of being that's soft and sweet and gentle and light and, you know, sugar and spice. Yeah. And male behaviour is seen to be slightly more aggressive, arrogant, um, forthright, sort of asking for what you want, mm. um, being quite demanding. Neither of these things are actually typically male or female traits because you can... I would say that I am quite masculine yes. in my mannerisms, in how I rugby scrum my way through commuters when I need to catch a train in the morning, in, you know, yes. in the way that I am quite confident and quite, you know... Not defensive, but I'm. I don't. I don't take shit. I don't suffer fools. Sure. I don't sit down and go. Oh, what would you like for dinner? I'm like. Yes. Well, this is. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm. Do you know. This is who I am. And I've been often described by my peers as quite masculine. And part of me thinks, is that because my formative jobs? I was in a fire service control room. My father was a paratrooper. Is, is it because I was brought up in a very ordered, military, structured, masculine-dominated mm. household? Or is that because I've, you know, because I've got, not abnormalities, but um, it, for me, is that nature or is that nurture or is that a conscious choice that I've made? I can't, I don't know, you I can't don't answer know that any question. You don't know more than anybody else does. But you can, that those behaviours are just what is put upon us from a very early age. Um, my son, when he was about three years old, he went to um, a children's centre and he... I went to pick him up from from the children's centre and it was a Montessori one, it was mm. the one that was closest to us. It was supposed to be very open-minded yes. and very lovely and very, like, allowing children to develop at their own pace and explore themselves and all of that stuff. And I was like, it's just up the road, that's why he went. I didn't, I didn't really... Yeah. I was like, looks nice, it's clean, you've got qualifications, lovely, and you go, yeah. off you go, see you later. Um, but they pulled me to one side... Um, when I went to pick him up one day, they went, oh, I, just want to, I just want to let you know that um, Jonathan wanted to wear a princess dress at nursery today. It's like, why are we whispering? <laughs> She's like, well, we, we didn't know. Yes. You didn't know what? He wants to play fancy dress. He wants a fancy dress as an astronaut. He's probably never going to be an astronaut, is he? He wants a fancy dress as a dragon. He's not going to be a dragon. He wants a fancy dress as a princess. Let him fancy dress as a princess. That's not me being all gay and liberal no. and all. He wants to stick a sodding dress on, fine. If he wants me to buy him a dress, fine. He doesn't. Well, I mean, he's a boy. I'm not he wants, here to he's defend, a boy defend boy. the nursery, he's... but there would have been other parents if they'd found out that their boy had been wearing a princess's dress, then the parents would have been cross. Now, really? I don't it's, know. It's, in, 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 in the not years. You. That not we're mean, in, but, but yeah, I guess some. Well, look at Lewis Hamilton the other day. I know, and now making a nephew. point, nobbing around Disneyland with his nephew in a dress. You're yeah. like, yeah, look at your lovely PR well, stuff. Give him a break. Yeah, he's learning, isn't he? It's better, better, better to have acknowledged it rather than mm. brushed it under the carpet. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe. We're jumping ahead. Well, well, to take, like <laughs> take, take me back a bit further then to to school. Dad, dad uh -huh. after the army, dad joined the fire service. Mum was a nurse. 
So you've got a strong public sector yeah, tradition. Yeah, so my dad, my dad was in the army and then went in the fire service um, and my mum was a nurse. So strong working class. As much as everyone tries to make out that I was brought up with a silver spoon in my mouth, uh, my dad was a fireman and my mum was a nurse and then she slipped while holding a patient when I was about four years old right. and was disabled um, ever since. So we had one parent on absolute pittance benefits before yes. DLA was really a thing and my dad working as a fireman basically living in south end working in brentwood hitchhiking up the a127 Seriously. not joining us for dinner in the evenings because him and mum of later found out didn't have dinner i think people try they were so that, there are narratives in the media that try to paint that my family are loaded or were loaded or and i'm just looking at it and i go that's not what i remember we went and stayed in my nan's house in belfast and that was our summer holiday or an old aunt in Plymouth, and we'd drive for six and a half hours down to Plymouth to go and stay with an old aunt. There's a subtext to that coverage, which is if you are articulate and intelligent and opinionated, then you can't be poor. Well, I'm not really articulate, but I you talk are. enough that some of the stuff that I say probably makes a bit of sense Resonates. somewhere. And yeah. was it always like that? What were you like at 10? Bookish, quiet, very not very confident round jam jar glasses and my mum cut my fringe you know <laughs> so one of them kids um, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then secondary school you went to grammar school I went to grammar school Didn't... and again if I'd have known that 15 years later I'd be having to defend a decision my working class parents quite, made for me you're, you're, uh, I'm just going to 11. interrupt you. my wife tells me I interrupt too much on this no, so, so I'll be careful but you've, you've three or four times now you, you've you've referred to being misrepresented in the media. But you've referred, it's so, happened quite a lot. I, I know it has, but I also know that when I was preparing to meet you today, I, I, I think I thought your skin was thicker. The, these things have it's, hurt it's you, quite, haven't they? It is, I am, I am fairly thick-skinned, but anything about my family right. really, really annoys me because they didn't ask for this. No. They didn't ask for everything they've ever done or every decision they or I have done to be put under a spotlight. I'm because the one that got a, the, the book deal. I'm the one that got the... I'm the one that gets a knob around at the swanky parties and sit on Russell Brand's knee. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I'm the one that has the nice life. Yes. Um, and they're the ones that get dragged through comment sections all where were you when she was starving? Where we? I didn't tell them. That's where they were. So that, I took me eleven plus. Yeah. I went to a primary school that has been in special measures for the last god knows how many years. It's a you know bumfuck primary school up the top of the road basically that we could walk to, and I was the only one from my primary school to get into the grammar school in that year Gosh. the only kid because my parents having not much else used to sit down with me and my brother and taught us from a very young age to spell they bought us books that were well beyond our years they taught us to read before we went to school because we didn't have anything else we couldn't go to fancy clubs we couldn't go on fancy holidays we could sit down and look at the cards my mum had made to put on the wall with the spellings on it at the age of four because they wanted us to do well and um so I went to the grammar school. I came some 80-something in my 11-plus that year and I was shipped off to the grammar school and thrown into a world where I was the poor kid at the grammar school. Right. So all my friends were going to... So you hadn't stood out at to, primary school? I hadn't stood out at primary school because it was opposite a council estate yeah. and all the kids from the estate went to the primary so school and I fitted in marvellously. you became conscious of not fitting in? Very much so. Um, because everybody else had their mums had lilac, Mercedes soft top convertibles and holidays in Tenerife and all designer clothes and me and my brother would go to school in the back of my dad's white fire brigade Ford Transit van sitting on boxes in the back in the dark holding a strap and <laughs> making park around the corner we'd hop out of it like we were in the A-team <laughs> you know the school was six and a half miles away from the house and sometimes me and my brother would walk home from school because we knew that mum and dad didn't have very much money. So if they couldn't drop us off or pick us up, there's a pair of us, us against the world, walking home from school. Two hours, we were super fit. We spent a pound on chips, canned the bus fare back, and we'd, and we'd walk back from school. And it's such a different picture of the, ones, of the one that people think that I had. Yes. It's like, well, no, that was it. And I left school at 16, and I went and worked in a ship shop, and that was the end of that. So it's a... It's a, it's a... I mean, that education aside, that, that environment at home, an environment of learning, an environment mm. of intellectual inner life, that is at odds with the modern perception of what the working class should be like, isn't it? It's a very strange thing that's happened in the last 50 years. If you go, go back to Robert Trussell even further, mm. and you have this notion 
or even Orwell, the, the idea is that if you're poor and working class, then you are a bit thick and yes. a bit uninterested in the world outside. It's one of the yes. great triumphs of the of the right wing to somehow portray working class people as being thoughtless and often racist yeah. and blaming all of their problems upon simple lies yeah. rather than complicated truths. And that's perhaps what you challenge, what you fly in the face of. And I think they don't like it. No, they don't. It's, my dad is a very well-read man. Do you know well your man. place? Do you not know your place, Yeah, Jack? well, yeah, precisely. My dad is a very well-read man, and he, he was... And, and do you know what firemen often are? Yes, I know. And so you look back, and you look back in the day, it's from all that time spent sitting around the mess room, whereas yes. now you've got to go out and do community fire safety and fit smoke alarms and deal with, you know, no, make sure elderly downside. people have got yeah. fire escapes in their pool, houses. You could read a book. And, yeah, you could. You could sit around, you could play pool, you could read a book, you could have chats, you had a bit yeah. of banter, you had a bit of, uh, you know, you had camaraderie, you had time for decent discussion whereas now everything's got to be cleaned and every household in your area has got to be visited and cladding's got to be taken off high-rise flats now and you know and all, all of that whereas before you had time to sit down and and you know yes. spend some time so, so that was the yourself. home environment and it was in. very much I, I was in an environment of books and um, my mum is an avid charity shop shopper so we would we would trawl around charity shops with our pocket money and buy books so many books and yet school and, let you down and so, well, I just didn't, I didn't fit in, so I started to drop out. Sure. Um, and you came out at 15. Uh, yeah. As gay. I left. Yeah, I came out as a gay at school. And then left school at 16. Yeah, left school at 16. Um, but we just, we just bought books. And I was always nicking my dad's books, philosophy, politics, psychology. And I look now and I think, uh, I, I used to think, I don't know where I get my politics from. And then I, my dad was an FBU union rep and, you know, he bought me Jean-Jacques Rousseau for my 16th birthday and I think I think I probably know where I got my politics from actually. It's nurture, not nature. (laughs) There's there's a definite element of prodding me down the path whereas my brother is the most right-wing conservative. Is he really? Yeah, very much so. We nearly had a dust-up on Boxing Day. I think that's tradition, isn't it, at Christmas? His admiration for Ian Duncan Smith and I was like, oh no, I would had a sherry and I was like, let me at you. I think (laughs) it wasn't But yeah, I think partly does it to wind me up but partly, you know, we are both Two very different sides of the really? same coin. But uh, it's, it's how does right. he? How does he? Pro- I mean, how does he? How, I mean, you don't have to answer this because, as you say, it's, it's not. They haven't signed up for any of this. But how does he, or did he, process the portrayal of you as a sort of left-wing hero when his politics might have had him? If he really is an Ian Duncan Smith fanboy, he'd have been a lot closer to the Daily Mail world view of you than. I think he's in the RAF. Right. I think his biggest concerns about me in the press is his mate jacking off to be a picture in the paper. Yeah, so yeah. Right. I'm just to wind him up. So <laughs> I think we have that good political banter, but I think his most problem is we saw you on the telly again. Yes. I have to keep telling my friends you're a lesbian. <laughs> 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 well, that's healthier. That's amazing. Isn't it? That's it's a just a bit like, well, I, I just look like you, but a bit thinner. I mean, you, you might want to have a word with your friends. <laughs> 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 yeah, crikey, stay out of uniform. Yes, exactly. I'm getting a picture now of uh, of a very bright 16 year old who 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 was born out of a box. I was born, yeah, Yeah. I was born out of my box at school. When I um, started primary school, um, I was four or five years old at the reading age of an 11 year old yeah. and my mum was called into the school over it because they were furious with her she loves this story and she, she sat there as they, as they turned around and they said oh well we, we're going to have to bring her down a peg or two and my mum was like you'll do no such thing you know you're it's absolutely amazing. not oh well she's raced ahead of everybody else and my mum's like why has it got to be a race to the bottom? And how can that be a bad standards? thing? You know, of course, if you'd gone to a school like the ones I went to, you'd have been put on a gifted child programme. I was told at 11 when I went to my secondary school that I should be in a special needs school because I had autism. And my mum refused point blank. She was like, you will integrate my child. Basically, you will. There is, she's smart, but she needs to be kept occupied. And that's something that's stayed with me. You know, I need to be kept occupied. I get up to all sorts if I'm bored. You only have to follow me on Twitter to see that that's when, when the boredom sets I'm in, not, I'm like I'm not starting a row. Your, <laughs> some of your can, I, can I have a row with and, Max? And you're very hard to pin down, both on, on Twitter and in life and in this, and in this room now, because I've got so many different disparate strands that I now want to try to, to, to begin to tie together. The blog happens by accident because yep. you've become politically engaged in a way that you weren't previously, but you were intellectually engaged. You just 
got bored and let down by the formal education system. Yeah. But you're not, you're not, I mean, you're essentially an autodidact, not self-taught, but you've you've absorbed, not unlike Russell Brand, you've absorbed, because the education system has let you down, you've absorbed information, knowledge, learning from as many different sources as you can. Yes. So you have intellectual confidence, which is rare for someone from your class, mm -hmm. from your background, and... And suddenly all of these planets begin to align when you write that one blog post in which, and I'll read you a bit back. This, oh, good. <laughs> this, this morning, small boy had one of the last Weetabix mashed with water with a glass of tap water to wash it down with. Where's mummy's breakfast, he asks. All big, big blue eyes and two-year-old concern. I tell him I'm not <laughs> hungry, but the rumblings of my stomach call me a liar. But these are the things that we do. You can write, Jack. You can really write. Thank you. I wrote that on my mobile phone in the middle of the night, absolutely furious. And I was going to write that, give my son to his father and top myself in a bath. That was my plan. That was my game plan. Because you were at the I end. I was at the end of my tether. And who were you furious with? The woman who kept phoning me to say, I'm sorry, your housing benefit's been stopped. We just don't know why. And I'm like... But you need to find out why. And once I screamed at her down the phone. I was like, I'm not proud of it, but I was at the absolute end of my tether. My housing benefit had been stopped, which meant that my letting agency charged me a late payment charge again. Mm. My housing benefit was only 70% of my rent anyway. So I was using housing benefit and child tax credits and child benefit to pay my rent. So when one of those payments slipped, I fell even further behind. I had about £1,000 in rent arrears, which doesn't sound like very much. Yes, it does. But it's an awful lot when you get £160 a week in housing benefit so you've got to get eight weeks worth of housing benefit now but you've missed one payment and they can give you a section 21 and evict you you're constantly chasing your tail you're making pittance payments just to knock something off the debt in the hope that they won't kick you out and I was furious with the woman on the phone who just repeatedly kept saying, I'm really sorry Miss Monroe but I just don't know why and I went to her do you know what I know what you earn I know what you earn. You earn about £25,000 a year and you've got a job and your job is to sit on the phone and tell me that you don't quite know why you're ruining my life but you can't fix it and you won't fix it. And you earn twenty five grand a year for that to casually evict me from my home off the other end of the phone. Why have you got a job and I haven't got a job? <laughs> but we know, like, we, do, we know part of the answer to that. Part of it, I mean... I mean, that's a computer says no moment that you've described. Uh, but it was it? so often, though. 17 times in a year and a half. So... Where was your son's father for, for, for during this period of... He's a brilliant man. He is. And he's, yeah, he's always... We've always done basically 50-50 childcare between us. Um, but also he has a job and a life. Yes. Um, so and he you had a job and a life, which you gave yes, up I to had look to, after yes. the boy because otherwise no one else would have been able to. Exactly, so, because just, I couldn't have asked his dad to cover my shifts because in the fire service, two days, two nights, four days yes, off. it's crazy. So you essentially, I'd essentially be asking him to do five straight days in a row plus the day after my night shifts because I'd have yeah. been inhuman. So actually then I'm saying, oh, will you do six days on, two days off and yeah. fatherhood, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So that's not, that's not why, that's not why you have children. Um, and I, yeah, and he's always been brilliant. Yeah. Um, I've kept him out of the press spotlight because I don't, again, these people didn't ask for all this. I get to have all the joy. They don't get to get doorstep. No, I understand I've that. i furiously chased journalists yes. off both his doorstep and my mother's doorstep before and just been like absolutely no you don't get to do this um they are they've got their own children now they're entitled to a private life and they're entitled to live a normal decent life i mean yes. what he knocked me up once he doesn't have to get hunted down for the next 18 years over that the poor son had to put up with so waking up with me one morning he doesn't have oh, to <laughs> he doesn't have to sort of pay for that, that for the next 20 years forgive me for sounding like my granddad but does that mean you're bisexual no, it means that I had a bit of a, a bit of a, what would this be like, sexual? Okay. Well, <laughs> anyway, yes. right. Exploratory moment. Curiosity. And, uh, yeah, you know, else. it was like, you know. Um, Which ended I mean, in, in many ways in the best possible he was one way. Of the, he was one of my best friends. And right. sometimes you're at a wedding and you have a few ciders and you're looking at your best friend through some new lenses and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> hello. And, um, and, um, and then you make a baby. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's and, that. And, and, and you don't live happily ever after. Because <laughs> but we do, because never... do you know what? We've never had any animosity between us. We've been the, We've been the greatest of friends for years. We continue to be very good friends. We've never had a row. And, and for two people, quite headstrong, stubborn people, raising a child yeah, together absolutely. but separately, we've never had a row. We've never fallen out. We've, you know, we're up front with each other when things piss us off. We, you know, we, we do the best we can for the little person who's in between us. And 
And that's fine. It and is. the only time we've ever really fallen out is when The Sun printed an awful article in which they claimed that I'd made all sorts of spurious claims about him being a terrible father. And, and um, I found out that day that he reads The Sun. <laughs> like, might not have slept with you if I'd have known. Um, <laughs> but we're still talking and it's fine. Well, where, and again, you're doing it, you're dragging me off in different directions. <laughs> where would The Sun have got that idea from? I mean, would they... They, they just meandered some things that I said and made them... I, I find tabloid press dumbs me down for their readers quite a lot. Right. And, I, and I was with my other half a couple of days ago and I showed her an article that had been written about me in the mirror. And she went, you don't talk like that. I was like, no, I know. I was, and I, but I wanted her to see because yeah. we've always had a zero Google clause for each other. We've always been like, no, we don't Google each other. We are in the relationship that yeah. we're in and we don't Google each other. But I showed her this because I wanted her opinion on it because I was like, maybe I do just sound dumb. Um, but they hadn't. They'd really dumbed down basically the way that I talk. And I know I'm common and I've got an Essex accent or whatever, but there was no words of more than two syllables in that whole... Are you sure article. that's you and not that's being patronised and not their readers? No, it's their readers. Yes. They, in that article as well, they insisted on in calling me Jackie because they right. said their readers won't understand that you're a girl called Jack. And they can't explain it. Yeah, and I was like, well, you could just use my name. And that's the mirror, which is kind I know, of it the was, side of the angels. It was, <laughs> but yeah, and, I was just, and that was my first real foray with the press. So the tabloid press do tend to, like any newspaper really, they take your story but then they mush it through their agenda and so it comes into, out. How do we get the biggest emotional reaction yeah, out of this regardless exactly, of the truth? Out of their readership. Whether so it's hate or The Sun didn't or... want, oh, single mum gets booked in off 9p burgers. They wanted a feckless father in the background. And, oh, you know, I see. Yes, and of course like, but, there, but there, there wasn't one. My There's dad no one wasn't. To, so, so His dad happens, wasn't. <laughs> There's no one to get cross with in this story of this yeah, yeah, they need so, they need is something other rather than just a, a sort of and they working can't get class girl makes good because they keep telling their readers that the system is great and yeah, the only people who are um, ruining it are those taking the piss and so I demanded the tapes. Yeah. I didn't get them, but I I had had a furious email exchange with the um, guy who'd written the piece, and then I forwarded that whole email exchange to my son's dad and went, "Look, this there is you there you go," and, and I'm really sorry. And please tell your friends lesson. to stop slagging me off on Facebook, thanks. <laughs> and that's, and that's, you back, know, and back that's to fine. The, back to the bleak moment when you yep. were on your phone and you were, I didn't realise, forgive me, that you were, um, you know, poised to, to hurt yourself. That's OK. It didn't, it didn't work like most things in my life. But I did it half-assed and so I was still here. <laughs> what did, how did the fight back begin, if that's the right word to use? It, people started listening and then I realised I had more to say. And so I carried on and carried on because I was suddenly like, oh, God, people are listening. I can't do myself in now, can I? Because someone's finally paying attention. I didn't want the attention. If I'd have wanted attention, I'd have made a porno. Do you know what I mean? It's just not... You it's wanted, not, you wanted <laughs> but to, I, be, to be heard. But I just... Well, I wanted to say the things that were bottled up inside yeah. and I've worked out through um, quite a lot of therapy that that's quite a helpful thing to do is For not sure. carry around your darkness inside you and mull it over because it grows and grows into a, a, an uncontrollable monster it's just get it out somewhere whether that's writing down or going for a run or writing a blog be factual but don't be afraid to be emotional but just get it out and in passing I would note that the mental health issues self-harm issues that a lot of trans people have to cope with. Mm. I mean, the statistics are inarguable on this. You're considerably more likely to suffer from... That, that, that tallies with what you're saying, because you're growing up yep. not fitting in to the yep. paradigm, the binary paradigm, not quite understanding that you don't fit into mm. a binary, not even knowing what words like binary paradigm mean. No. <laughs> and that means you are, from a very, very early age, you're screwing down yep. your own consciousness, and, and that's why you need to unscrew it yep. and, and well, you it need and to get things out it's one of the things that I know that people that there's a real there's a real horrible mockery of um, trans communities online yes. people like Tumblr trans communities people are really like 
really um, patronising about it and disconcertingly so because when I was a teenager, any any online forum or group that you could join, whether that was for Dungeons and Dragons or whether it was for, you know, Star Trek appreciators of a female variety um, or anything that you definitely had nothing to do with me was not no, no historical search posts available there. Um, but, you know, anything really... Of a community coming yes. together as a community because there are no longer really community clubs and community groups in the way that when I was a kid you'd go to girls brigade or mm. you'd go you know you'd, you'd there's no there's no longer really places where you can meet people who have shared interests other than a book club a pottery club or online yes. um, and so you you gravitate towards online you can be more yourself um, online, really, I think, than you can be in a room with someone because there's no awkwardness, there's no social awkwardness there. Um, you can just be yourself, and obviously, there's the other side of that where you can be anyone you want to be. Yes, and you can but be that much allows than you would ever be in real life as but well. But that also allows you to explore other parts of your identity and other parts of your personality in a place where there's no real recourse for that. There's no real comeback for it. So I wish, you know, I wish I had had the communities that are out there now there's a lot of negative stuff on the internet but there's also a lot of a lot of it's like one big common room right. and and the key word in that is common you can find you can what find you people with which common. you share common ground obviously that leads to sort of terrible things as well um you know like right-wing communities people right. who would yes, normally have awful mean. thoughts of yes. their own in their bedrooms can now find other people to validate those awful yes. thoughts but on the whole i think um communication online is a is a positive thing especially for young trans people well, who the are the more alienated for, you are from the from the yeah. status quo the more valuable that the more valuable that connection ability with a stranger to gather is yeah. becomes so then it seems as if this was the first time that you felt that you belonged to a community when you started writing your blog and when it started, not on the trans side of it, but just on the everything else side of it. You, 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 you yeah. felt valued. You realised that you're going to be modest now, I know, already, <laughs> but you people were valuing you and learning from you and, and that hadn't happened to you before. No, not really. And what I'd... Because I'd always been the outsider I'd always yes. been the underdog I'd been the one that was thrown down the stairs at school I was, I was that kid mm. um, you know I've got a birthmark on my leg that's 11 port wine stain birthmarks all about size for 50 pps and all through um, senior school I was backwards and forwards to Great Ormond Street Hospital having it lasered off it didn't work the thing's as stubborn as I am it's still there um, but I couldn't learn to swim when right. my peers were learning to swim so I still can't swim right. um, because as an adult you feel like a right hit in a school pool full of like five-year-olds firstly you feel a bit odd the older you get and the hairier you get and the more hirsute you get the less likely it is you want to go and, go and get in a swimming pool with a load of children yes. and go teach me to swim yeah. i look at all these babies doing this really simple thing i can't do so there were lots of things that i couldn't do at school that everybody else just did and now I'm like, I'm nearly 30 and I still can't swim and I'm fine with that. I just live right by the open water. There's no, nothing and can go found, wrong here. You've found lots of um, things that, that, that you can't can <coughs> do. I've found things I can do. And the first time I got a letter from a reader, like a thank you card, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was working at the local paper and they sent it via the local paper. And I felt like a fraud. Someone had suddenly written to me to say, your recipes and your writing has changed my life. Yes. And I was like, no, no, this can't be for me. This can't be for me. But that, that must have been part of the reason for this doing it, for oddly. Me. I understand is, what you're saying. And now I continue... Now I have over a 1,000 of those letters in A4 lever arch files in my living room, and I keep every single one because when people online are telling me to kill myself because I'm worthless and I'm useless and my recipes are shit, I just go and I pick one out, I sit down at the table and I go, I'm valued... What I do matters. People appreciate me. This is nice. Okay, that's enough of that. But it's a, yeah, it's a, corrective. a thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a positive reinforcement thing that what I do has an impact somewhere on someone, and so I will continue to do it until, until I no longer get messages from people saying thank you for teaching me to cook, or thank you for being a voice for people like me, or thank you for standing up for trans people, or you know all the all the letters I get like daily. Now, I don't print out all the emails and stuff because there would just be too many. 
And I've started to accept it now. I've started before. I was always like, every single one was like it was burning my hand. I'd open it up be like, ah, mail, mail from a stranger. And it would, it would terrify me because I'd be like, I can't live up to your expectations. Please don't put me on a pedestal. Please don't try and make me the voice for your people because I don't even know who I am, let alone how I can speak for you. And now I just go, if what I say resonates with people and what I do helps people, I will continue to do it. And there's an allegory there for, for your life in a way with the, with the move from the blogosphere, which I could see feeling to you as if you were dancing with nobody watching, mm. to suddenly... Realising you're stage. dancing in a fish tank <laughs> suspended above the shard or something, and going, ah, in your underpants. Yes. <laughs> going, right, so, so shit. Just, <laughs> just, just, just talk me through that, <laughs> from, from that, that, that horribly bleak night. And then writing, um, and you wrote about things that, again, uh, that some journalists have subsequently, some right-wing newspapers have subsequently chosen to be sceptical about, about selling your phone or your DVD or turning off the fridge. Because um, it's empty anyway. <laughs> turning off the hot water. And then, I still do. Do you know what? I, just I, because you're because you're conscious of the money and yeah, it's a waste Yeah, absolutely. I'm on a gas key meter and I'm fanatical about it. I flick my heating off at night. I just turn it on for an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. Mm. And it's if it's if if the house is cold, it's cold. Right. You know, I wear jumpers. I've got two on at the moment. I'm like, no, this is fine. And um, you know, if it's a running well, joke with guests. Yeah, I don't have not. hot water all the time. I have hot water to have when a shower in the it. morning and do the washing up in the afternoon. You turn a tap on at mine, the water comes out cold. It's a bloody luxury yeah, tap on the time. You can have a combi time. boiler. I'm not, I don't want it to go or do the boys' hall. So you could have a combi boiler and then it only like turns on when you so turn it on. No, I know. I'm, just, I, I'm not going to give you lessons on plumbing. Why do I have hot water coming out of my tap? Oh, no, it's all right. You're not, you're yeah, not I know, being but I'm just saying, well, do you know, it's, it's fine. It's, like, it's a luxury. No, I get, I get that. So when, get, when, get, when did you realise. I know two million for the for the for the big one for the hunger hurts one. Yeah, well, should we make sure that people understand that's readers, not pounds? Uh, <laughs> so if yes, I have two million pounds, I'd be skyping this from a beach it? somewhere. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> if um, I had two hundred pounds, I'd be skyping this from a beach somewhere. And then it then it became a living. Yes, but not overnight. No, it could gradually sort of. My readership maintained not the levels that it did with Hunger Hurts, no. but I continued to write about politics, but I started to look at politics on more of a national scale because I suddenly realised all my readers weren't in South End on Sea. Yes. And as brilliant as the like Development Control Committee for, you know, for the local borough council probably is, it's probably not that interesting to that many people. Um so I started to write about politics nationally, but I kept my focus really on food and money-saving tips. Mm. And not in a way that, you know, a newspaper will just pull it out of thin air every now and again. Sure. Quick, scrub around for 10 life hacks that you didn't yes. know that will save you some money. I was going, I've gone to the supermarket with £6 and here's what I've come home yes. with. So it was imperfect because they were. it was my day-to-day -day life decisions under a, a microscope. Which so makes people it so much more compelling. People would scrutinise things all the time that I was right. doing, yes. and, and, you know. As I found a fiver once down the back of my sofa, and um, instead of putting it with my six pounds and going, I could have 11 pounds for my food yeah. this week, I went and bought two tubs of Ben and Jerry's and sat yes. on the couch and ate the one after the other because I hadn't had ice cream oh, for so long. Course, I hadn't had a becomes... treat for so long. I hadn't had a luxury for so long. And um, for Christmas that year, friends and family were like, what do you want? And I was still not really telling them the truth about how terrible things were mm. and how I was living. And so I was like, oh, a Starbucks gift card would be nice because then I can have a hot chocolate with some marshmallows and on. And I was like, yes, it's glorious. You have to spend it um, in Starbucks. You yeah, can't, you can't absolutely. I in. have to go and have a treat. I can take the boy. We can have um, marshmallow swizzles. It's going to be great. <laughs> uh, obviously, it resonated and it touched a lot of people, partly because they'd have been in similar circumstances. How common is your experience as a, as a single but supported mother, supported as in your boy's father is supportive and, yeah. and, and you do it together. It, it, it's hard when you're a, a liberal but very middle class person to know what life on benefits is like. You know that it's not the cliche of the Daily Mail portrayal, but you hope that it's not Road to Wigan Pier. And yet a lot of what you've written suggests it's a lot closer to Road to Wigan Pier than it is to the Daily Mail's feckless, work shy layabout narrative, li one in living four, it up on benefits. One in four single mothers in Britain are living in poverty. And that's that. That is not knowing if you'll be able to eat tonight. Yeah. As long as one you've got five, a bowl of pasta for the baby. One in five parents in Britain has skipped a meal to feed their child this year. 
one in four single mothers in Britain is living in poverty. 19 million people in Britain are living below the poverty line. And it's a similar number. I think 17 million and that is what couldn't get their hands is. on £100 yes. if they absolutely needed to. That, that shocks me. That utterly doesn't shock you. Not in the slightest, because I work with these people day in, day out. And they're people from all walks of life. And so much of the commentary is built upon the presumption, very lazy presumption, but a forgivable one, that there must be something about your life that's a bit like the life of this person writing an article. There must be, there must, but there isn't. I mean, you are talking about this, this, this notion of hand to mouth is a figure of speech in most people's worlds, whereas it's, it's a it matter of fact. It literally is what it is. Hand to mouth, it's literally. And, and along once the you've pavement. eaten, there's nothing left. Yeah, you're walking along the pavement looking for pennies. And that I mean, is that's why... Just, that's just shit, yes, frankly. There, yeah, there is no noble... But you've only got to... And there is no nobility in poverty, none whatsoever. There's nothing... There's nothing... You don't, you don't achieve some kind of Buddhist enlightenment by sitting in your dark flat with your telly that you sold, not no longer in there, with the lights off and the heating off, meditating. Right. You're sitting there going, God, this is cold. God, this is Maybe shit. Maybe you didn't meditate I wonder if hard death enough. is warmer. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, you know... So... This is what's fascinating, isn't it? Is that it's there's a, there's a sense of serendipity or or accident to what happened, but because you were doing it for the, I mean, utterly sincere reasons. This was literally you just giving yourself therapy by writing down what you were Basically. doing, touching people's lives, and then touching them in a very material way by giving them a way to feed themselves and their family, without spending every last penny in their pocket or their purse. That that that's really interesting because it means that your recipes are. I hope this doesn't sound too pretentious, but your recipes are actually quite political in a way. Yes, my food's always been political. Um, so um, I insisted with my first cookbook that Hunger Hurts was published in full as an essay in the front of it. And I did the same with my second cookbook. I didn't do the same with my third, but it's um, only because I think that people will, it's, will it's have read it. Now, yes. um, but it does... It's. I mean, it's, I wish I brought a copy with me, but it's... Um, it's very, still very political. There's, there's, it's excoriating in places in the way that it's it absolutely skewers like Tory welfare policies, things like that. I say to my editor sometimes, I'm like, Carol, how did we get? How, how are we getting away with this? And she's like, it's what people expect from you. It's what they want from you. So all the political articles I've ever written for The Guardian, for anybody else, have been about food. And all my food is enshrined in politics. It's, you shouldn't have to live this way, but if you find yourself living this way, here is how I can help you. And I've always been, here's what you can donate to food banks. Food banks are the scourge of our society, but here's what you can yeah, donate to food yeah. banks. So everything is caveated with, this is shit, but, but I'm offering you a way That's so out dangerous of though, isn't it? I mean, you must worry about this more than I do, but because the, the, you've just nailed something there which david cameron tried to dress up as the big society things that, oh oh i was oh i'm sure but th <laughs> yes. things that should be the, respons <laughs> the responsibility of a civilized society the society should be providing but this curious so-called compassionate conservatism suggests that the volunteer like didn't reese mogg say he found food banks uplifting 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 i was like you never fucking queued at one have you right. you clearly it's and i and i find it because i've done a lot of talks in parliament about food banks and there was i did a speech at tory party conference um why so do you, you do that are you hoping to change people's minds are you hoping to open people's they, uh, eyes it was part of an oxfam panel right and um the tory party conference found out that i was the speaker on the panel um because they just put representative from oxfam mm. and i was working with oxfam at the time uh, Tory Party Conference found out there was me three days before and revoked my pass. They oh, were like, really? no, you're not coming. Gosh. And I was like, well, I am actually. Um, so you... And do you, do you, do you want to... Well, I, see I, light bulbs? Do you see pennies dropping sometimes when you're... What happened like that? in that particular circumstance was they took me off the programme. Right. They took the panel off the Conservative Party Conference programme yeah. so as not to advertise it. Right. So then what happened was they made it something that people wanted to go to and right. they completely right. shot themselves in the secret, foot. Secret handshake. So it was it was a fringe event, but it was in... Um, I can't remember which hotel it was in. It was Brighton, not Manchester. Yeah. And um, the it was standing room only and there were people out the doors. The hotel was had like a circular gallery staircase and the whole gallery was full of people standing outside to hear me speak. Um, and it was our food banks a sign of hope or failure. And I 
absolutely slaughtered the entire Conservative Party in my speech. One of them was um, an MP from Cambridgeshire, and he was like, oh, there's only 464 food bank users in my constituency. And I went nuts at him. I was like, well, what use is the 1% chance when the 1% chance is you? You could say you've got 1% chance of living in poverty, but when I tell you poverty is suicidal ideation, it's freezing, it's starving, it's losing your children, it's malnutrition, it's rickets. How can you be proud that 454 people in your constituency are suffering from this? How dare you even think that just one is okay and he was absolutely mortified (laughs) um i got a standing ovation but what i actually got off the back of that that was more important was um baroness jenkin and jenkin came forward at the end and said what can i do to help now Anne jenkin does the live below the line challenge every year for um, charity lives off a pound a day to raise money she was their top fundraiser um, until i decided i would do the challenge too and now we sort of we're neck and neck yeah Yeah. and it's good it's healthy competition because it all raises money for charity and awareness um and so she um then went on after a discussion with me to set up the all-party parliamentary group with frank field that did the Feeding Britain report. So yes. did its 57 um, recommendations to Parliament for preventing hunger in Britain. And that was off the back of my speech at Tory Party Conference. So when people say, what can I do? What, why do you bother? They say, well, yeah. it's all very well me writing articles for The Guardian, but I'm preaching to people who already donate to food banks, who already give their like give money to Oxfam and to other organisations to try and resolve hunger in Britain. What you need to do is you need to actually go and look at the cause of the problem and shout in its face and say, this was you, what are you going to do about Mm. it? And there's... It's... I've never been invited back, (laughs) Um, (laughs) which is a shame. Um, Because I would would go back and do it, because I think that sometimes... That's why people say, why do you give interviews to the Mail? Why do you talk to the Express? It's like, well... Because they're the people that oh, really this. need to hear yes, of course. what I have to say. Yeah, well, 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 I mean, I've worked for LBC, so, so yeah. precisely so that I can talk to people that wouldn't normally Exactly, talk to people who wouldn't naturally tune in and, yeah. and just drill in that, you know, this is a problem, but it's a problem you can help resolve. Because on Facebook, we all want to feel useful. We all want to do good, I think, most of us. And if you, you can still offer think people... That, a, even, even after the last couple of years, internationally, not, not just in I, your own life? have to believe yeah. and genuinely do believe that we are chance. that people are inherently kind and good people who are not people who are unkind to me on the internet for example people who troll me or are rude sometimes i tap in and i go what's wrong yeah. what's what what happened yeah. like who hurt you i'm sorry about I'm, I'm sorry about whatever it is in your life that's making you react in this way at the moment and if there's anything i can do to help let me know which uh, i went through a phase of that and i would get these outpourings from people oh sorry i'm just going through a divorce at the moment or you know or i had an abusive boyfriend and he was also called jack and your name was tricky for you it was the things i've heard from people just by giving them space just by to giving be them vulnerable. going look are you okay and sarah silverman did something recently when a guy called her a cunt on the yeah. sorry <laughs> on, the, right. uh, on, on the internet right. and she went back to him yeah. and went like are you okay and and the exchange that followed is very similar to many that I've had in private messages with people through the years. So I think that people who are lashing out are angry and are upset at something. Yeah. And But most of us are inherently kind and good and given the opportunity to do good and be good and be better, we will take it. And nothing sorry cold coming out in full form it was my sinus is going you've spoken enough now we're we're nearly there (laughs) i think that most people given the opportunity would choose to be good people and you sometimes have to just offer them a very simple way to do that and go look here's what you can donate to a food bank or here's how you can make a change here's how you can make a difference um, it's why so many of us get caught by charity high street people with Maybe. clipboards, you yes. know, because we can't, when pinned down in the glare of, do you want to help children? We go, yes. Of course I um, want to help children. Of course that, I want that... to help children. Maybe not with your clipboard. Yeah, um, I'm doing but, my own bit. But yeah. The I guess then that leads us neatly into the into the legal action with with Kate Hopkins because she is perceived very much as the patron saint of the toxicity and the nastiness that you've just described. I, I've noticed yes. a couple of tweets where you have actually 
attempted to discourage people from gloating over her misfortunes. Yeah, because I think, you know, she's lost enough. Yeah. Both her jobs, most of her dignity, now her house. I think at some point she feeds off this. Um, and, and the negativity really just reinforces her martyr status. Yeah. Um, that then encourages her to push her even further to the margins, even further to the right wing, even further underground. And I think I offered after the libel proceedings, I said, you know, I would, if if you came round for dinner or we went out for dinner and sat down and had a proper conversation about what happened, mm. I'll give it back. I've rescinded that offer because she was so rude about me the next day in the Evening Standard. I went, I don't want your money. What I want is your ear, basically. Why? I want I mean, you just to sit up. Why couldn't you just cash that cheque and, 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 and also offer to be But I just, want, I just, I just think that she's had a lot of pitfalls and disappointments, and this is me, cod psychology here, yeah. but from the children that I've raised, basically, all yeah. of them with very troubled backgrounds, um, there has been nearly no one that my parents have not taken in from very traumatic backgrounds and um, histories of disappointment and being let down and with love and support and a supportive environment and care and continuity, they have churned out some amazing adults, mm. you know, some brilliant chefs, some wonderful mothers, some absolutely brilliant people, a champion diver. It's like there's, I can't name any of them because it's all mm. confidential, but I'm trying really hard not to name them. Yeah, but it's, we're, we're you know, they're all brilliant people. They're yeah. all phenomenal people. Um, and I think that, you know, she's had, she had her setbacks. She's, she had... Her epilepsy meant that she couldn't go in the army in the way that she wanted. She's, you know, she was, she did The Apprentice. So she's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's gone on for her that probably hasn't gone the way that she wanted. And so she probably is a bit angry and is a bit furious and is using that anger now to lash out at other people. It's got attention for it. It's got a following for it. And mm. that can be addictive. When mm. a lot of people on the internet are, like, following you and lapping up your every word, that can be... You think, oh, what can, what can I say next in order oh, to generate danger, my next, yeah, my next yeah, thing? My and next hit. You see it sometimes with people who you think are great, and then you see them then churning out bollocks for attention, and you're just like, oh, this is tedious. <laughs> just stop. Just sit down. Just, just desist. Just... People will still follow you on Twitter if you don't say anything shit for a week. They really will. They'll just... In fact, they'll hang in waiting to see why you've gone quiet. I mean, Less it's, is more sometimes as well, of course. But I, do, but I think that genuinely that she can't continue to go down the trajectory that she's going down. She's either going to have to find God or, <laughs> or yeah. you know, or, or do something drastic in order to sustain the lifestyle that she's got. But I think that really... At the end of the day, she's probably not particularly happy with the image of herself that's portrayed. And yet and has to devote huge amounts of effort to furiously insisting that she's delighted. Someone I I told me a story about um, a male, a man who is also a very controversial character, and my friend's a TV producer. Um, I should say that when I was a single mum in poverty, none of my friends are TV producers. Mm. These are all people I've acquired over the last few years. <laughs> um Otherwise, I could have done a, like, keeping up with the Monroes and just Apparently, had a, like, a, a follow me in my trashy life around the supermarket with my handful of change, and I'd have been absolutely loaded by now. But, um, yeah, but it didn't happen. <laughs> but one of my friends is a TV producer and said that um, he um, used to look after a guy who is very famous for being very controversial. He's a real big, loud, Larry figure who's very well-known for basically being a bit of a dick. Mm. And he used to have to hold his hand all the way to his seat to sit him down because he was so terrified of the persona that he created. He couldn't quite bring himself to step into it when the camera started to roll. Yeah. And if anyone wants to know who that is, DM me. I should <laughs> um, find out but for libel proceedings, I'm um, not going to say who it is. No, but I, I people create and these you. monsters and, I, and these I hope personas you're right. themselves. I hope you're right because it, 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 allows, it allows you to cling on to the other thing you were saying about believing in the fundamental goodness of people. You do just end up creating these. I these see monsters. how easy it is, though, because for a while I was rolled out on breakfast sofas as the resident whinge. Yes. They were literally, they were like, oh, quick, we need someone to get angry with Julia Hartley Brewer over something. Jack, yes. oh, we need someone to have a 
row with this person about something, Jack, and I would do it because you know what? I can hold my own in an argument. Sure. I'm good at a debate. And eventually I sat down and went, do you know what I want to do? I want to teach people who are living in poverty how to cook. Yeah. I don't want to talk about children. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about other people's parenting. I don't want to talk about why trans women should be allowed to go to refuges. They should, by the way. Sure. I don't want to debate on breakfast I, I, television. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Because uh, sometimes but, by engaging in the debate, you're giving credibility to the other side, to the other even side. as you destroy Last night, them. Jack, can you come and debate this person about Christian concern, about gay cures? No. no because you because shouldn't be covering gay cures. Because do you know what I'm doing? Cures. I want to do children and adults who are living in poverty and help them out of it. And that's is that what your life's do. work? What's next, Jack? That's Monroe? my life's work. That what, is, I would devote myself to it until nobody ever? needs it anymore. Will you do yes. it from, you, you would yeah. like to run for I office. I was going to run for Parliament last year and then I got a death threat directly delivered to my letterbox and I just moved house and I was like, maybe not today. Gives you um, pause. If, if you had to... In a sentence, and we've only got a couple of minutes left, why okay. would you be getting a death threat? Because anybody who's just listened to this hour or watched it, and they would have had some preconceptions about you before. Some of them would have been challenged, others demolished, others enforced, <laughs> positive and negative. Yep. Why on earth would anybody want to put a death threat through your letterbox, do you think? The ones that I've had, and I've had quite a few, have basically been centred around the fact that I... Some of them have come off the back of um, an article I wrote about Diane Abbott. Mm. Um, I get lots of things now, um, graphic descriptions of how I should die and be raped with acid. And This was things. a defence of... In defence of Diane Abbott. It was, a, it was a, just before the election and it was... A, the, here, here's what you need to know, basically, yeah. about this woman who's been pilloried in the yeah. press. Yes. None of the media covered it because they were all like, Whoa. and I was like, oh, look, a different story to the one that you're mm. telling. But that got read seven million times mm. in a week. So I was quite happy my work there was done. Diane thanked me personally for it and I saw her do a few weeks later and she literally enveloped me in the biggest hug and it was lovely. Yeah. Um, but I get, I still get it. People are still daily, being, Why you get a death daily, for people that? saying you should have your next slit, you nigger loving whore. Right. On a daily basis, on a recipe book. Is it always was, racist? Is always, it all, right, okay, always. Then I get it. Um, and some of it is because I'm gay. I should yeah. have my child taken away. I'm a pervert. I'm like, well, I am actually a pervert, but you wouldn't know anything about that because I don't talk about it publicly. <laughs> that doesn't go with it. And, and, you know, yes. we're not going there today either. There are specialist websites for this discussion. This is not it. Um, and, yes, so it's just people just... Otherness. It's just difference. It's being a vocal woman, term I use quite loosely, but a vocal gay woman in the media who happens to shout about racism every now and then. And oh my God, if there's not something in there to hang me over, it just, it's just not worth the white supremacist getting out of bed in the morning, is it? <laughs> Never stop. I'll try. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to stop. Yeah, I, I, I sense <laughs> so, that. I sense that. So I'm on this juggernaut now. I keep going. I'm writing my fifth and sixth books now. Yes. And I got contacted yesterday by a publisher who was saying, would you consider doing your memoirs? So I was like, I'm not planning on dying anytime soon. Right. Thank you very it, much. What's going volume one? But yeah, it's like Stephen Fry did. Just be like, this is the well, first Kenneth bit. Branagh did it at 28. Yeah, I so, mean, you know, quite happily. There's a, there's a healthy history. Um, Jack, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. And thank you for the tea. It's Anytime. lovely.